Well, here's our next project, a Fisher AM80 tuner that I'm really looking forward to working on. And when I got it in, it came in pretty rough shape, as you see. It came with this removed and packed in a separate package. And it came with the dial cord broken, so we'll have to fix that. And these knobs came individually wrapped, and when I unwrapped them, the funk came out. Okay, when I was, you know, when my kids were little, and one of my children would get sick and they would throw up, unfortunately I would have to make my wife clean it up. I just, I, I, I apologized profusely, but I just couldn't take that smell. And that is exactly, I know these don't have that white, uh, whatever it's called, that fungus on them, but the smell of these is horrible. So you saw them, here they are, this is how they showed up. There, and I'm going to throw my glove away. And hopefully those will soak in the simple green a little bit and we'll be able to clean them off. Now then, so as with many of the older Fisher designs, things are a little bit different than what you would expect. So on the right, this knob here is nothing but the tuning knob, which we would expect. On the left, you would expect a volume control, but this, in fact, is not volume. Now, there is a power switch that you can turn on and off. And this outer ring here is actually a selector switch. And you can see from the dial face, you can select between broad, medium, and sharp bandwidth for the tuner. And this is an AM only tuner. But it also has input selects. It has a phono, an auxiliary one, and an auxiliary two. Isn't that cool? But this is not a volume knob. If you look, it's a sensitivity knob. And if we look at the schematic, in fact, it is not a volume knob, but rather at the very input of the RF amplifier, it is a sensitivity knob. So this does not have a, a preamp as per se. So this is a line level output and it's unattenuated. And so you would feed this into a, a normal preamp and amplifier, like an integrated amplifier, and the volume and everything would be on your amplifier. So once again, this is a very unique design, as, as usually you find out in this older Fisher equipment. That's why I like working on it, because it's very interesting. It's different. So we're going to try to get this working. And I don't know anything about if it functions or not. You can see this does not have a normal plug. This connector was made, this probably came out of a module, like out of a console system or something. And this was designed to plug into the amplifier module or something like that. So we'll have to put a wire a different power cord on this if we want to use it separately. And you can see by the number of vacuum tubes, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tubes in this thing. So it is uh, you know, one rectifier. But this is actually going to, I hope, going to be a very sensitive AM tuner. So the first thing that struck me right out of the box when I took this thing out was the, the sheer weight. I mean, this thing's relatively small. Here's my hand. But for its size, look at that, 10 pounds, 100 and, 160 ounces, 4.547 kilograms. Really, for a, just an AM tuner with no preamp, it's pretty heavy. So this thing is built like a tank, and uh, it should be really interesting. This doesn't even have the case on it yet. Looking at the back of this thing, well, I didn't entirely tell you the truth. It does have a volume control. It just has an output level, which is this little pot back here. And you can see it's a miniature pot. There's your output, and there's your three inputs. It'd be interesting to know what kind of phono input. I'm, I'm assuming this is a crystal cartridge phono input, so it will not run a magnetic cartridge. So it probably does not have 
a uh, preamp, let alone a you know an RIAA stage. So this is just for a mono ceramic cartridge turntable. So on the inside, it looks pretty much untouched. You can see what looks like a death capacitor here, but other than that, you only have this wax, this one, and this one. You have three wax capacitors, so really there's not a whole lot to restore. We're going to check all the resistors and make sure they haven't drifted. And really, this radio should work. Uh, we'll check the main filter capacitor here, make sure that it's good. Uh, it may need replaced because it's been kind of sitting for a while. Okay, before we connect this up to test it, I just want to make sure this decoupling capacitor going to the output isn't shorted because I don't want any kind of stray voltage or anything going into my test amplifier. So we're just going to statically test it with the with the VTVM and I'm going to just touch this and you can see very high resistance so there's no shorts in that capacitor. Now of course we don't know what's going to happen when we apply voltage but it should be okay. I don't think there'll be any problems there. So just a quick test. So let me plug this in and according to the instructions, let me move the camera a little bit, according to the instructions if we just have a, I'm going to hook it to the outside antenna, so you have to jumper these two pins together, and then your antenna goes into this pin. And if you look over here, that's what I've done. I have it wired. I have the outlet wired, and I have the smallest dim bulb right here wired into the circuit. So we're going to plug it in and see if this thing turns on. Let me plug in the antenna. Hopefully we'll get some kind of... Maybe it'll come on. Who knows? Okay, the light came on and then went dim. So that's a good sign. See if we get any sound out of the speaker. Uh-oh, I hear some scratchiness. Okay, so nothing on the antenna. Oh, well, it would help if I connected it again. Hey! Not very sensitive, but... Well, that's definitely not something to listen to, but okay. Well, I think the general consensus is that it works, and this is good. Of course, I'm running on way reduced voltage. If you look here, that's it'll probably get a lot more sensitive if we put more power on it. But you can see just that little 40 watt bulb, how dimly lit it is. So it's really limiting the voltage quite a bit into this. And I do have that <laughs> death capacitor clipped on one lead. I just have one lead clipped off. So as I expected, it works because there's really not much to go wrong in this. So now we can kind of go through and check a few things and see how it works. All right, we got the bottom of the radio cleaned up a little bit. We got the three capac or yeah these three caps replaced and the the filter or the uh, line cap replaced with a safety cap. Everything else looks good. So now we're on to our favorite part of the whole thing, the dial cord. And luckily, the owner that had this sent the dial cord in three pieces so you have part of it still connected to the dial we have the part that still has the spring on it 
and then we have the part that was still connected to the tuning gang which I removed and luckily the little bit of a service manual that we do have does show the actual way to rewire the string. The problem is usually the first thing they'll give you in here is they'll tell you the actual length of the string to cut it to. But they don't tell you that in this one so we're just going to have to... I have this piece left here. Hopefully it's, it looks more than long enough so it should be good. So I'm going to just leave it full length. It does mention about uh, wrapping adhesive type tape where the string is inserted under the pointer and a few things like that. And this old one did have some of this nylon tape where it hooks on to the end. I don't know how much of this I'm going to be able to do on camera with you, but I'll try to do some because I know I've had a lot of people ask about this. Uh, they want to know how to restring these in general, and they're all a little bit different. So you can see here we have the two little hooks. So one of them is going to actually have the loop, and the other one's going to have the actual spring on it like this. So, And the, the idea of a dial cord is once everything's wrapped around there, you want the cord to be a little bit shorter than it needs to be. And then this spring will actually stretch. And it keeps tension on all of this. And this is what allows you to have accurate adjustment of your tuning dial. So that's very important. The other thing I did was I took just a rotary Dremel tool with a wire brush and kind of ran it in the grooves here and cleaned this off really well. Same thing over here, clean this off. So the string has a really nice path to run on without getting all gunked up. Instead of tape for this part here, I'm going to use this little piece of sleeving. It's like a nylon sleeving. And we're going to feed the wire through that, or the dial string through that. And I'll just do some. I'm not going to do this whole thing on camera because that'll take too long, but we'll go through and we'll tie this up and make a loop and then that loop can connect on here and then we'll start following the little diagram. And I've found it's really important to move the dial into roughly the position. So if you look, here's the, here's the dial shaft here, which is right here. And they're showing this at just kind of a slight angle pointing away from it, but it being kind of on the top. That's really important to know what position this is on so you know which end the spring goes on and which end the cord goes on. So the cord goes here and then it's going to wrap around the front and come around like that. It's going to make one complete turn, then it's going to go over here, it's going to drop down onto the tuning shaft. It's going to wrap around three turns. Then it's going to come off here and that's where it's going to make its big loop and then come around. And then it's going to come up the bottom and up and over this end here and then connect to the spring which will go to right here. So that's the general idea of how we're going to do this. So let me get this tied off here real quick and then we'll be back. Alright, so I have this tied off. And what I like to do when I make these knots to keep them from coming out is you can use some CA glue or some super glue, but it takes a little bit of time to dry. But I found if you go to the dollar store and just buy a really inexpensive bottle of quick drying clear nail polish, this stuff works perfectly for this and it just keeps, keeps this from coming apart. And once you do that, then you can uh, kind of clip this a little bit shorter, just like that. And then if you really want to, you can take your soldering iron and just kind of touch this off. You can use a match too, but it's just as easy to do this. And this will just melt the end so that it doesn't keep fraying all the time. There you go. See that? And there, now that's ready. And we can connect this on here and bend the little tab over. 
So once you do that, you kind of put this loop over the tab there and then just bend the tab over to hold it. And the, the reason they have you put that little piece of tape or sleeving on there is because the edge of this can be kind of sharp and it will eventually cut through that and it'll break. So this just pre prevents that from happening. So now what we want to do is we want to do our three turns, or our one full turn, I'm sorry. So we're going to wrap this around here. And we're going to go just like that. And then this is going to come up over. So now I'm going to move this. Hopefully I have enough cord on here. I really didn't measure it, but probably should have before I started. And if you have a hard time with all this staying in place, you can always take a little piece of tape and put on here, which is what I might do. All right, let me back this camera up a little bit. And you can see right here where I have I have this hanging off the edge of the bench so that I can kind of reach underneath here. I may have to move it a little more off the bench. And I kind of have the camera between me and the bench. So we're going to go over here through this. And I'm not really worried about being on the pulley. I just want to get it through here for now. Just like this. This is my least favorite part of radio restoration, by the way. And the first thing we want to see is which side do you want the do you want the cord to go over? Meaning, do I want the cord to go? You can see when it comes down over here, it has to go around the front, the front facing me side of the shaft, and it's going to go counterclockwise around there. That's really important because that's going <laughs> to I've put them on backwards before and it's not fun. Any of you that watch my channel know my propensity to make mistakes. And uh, I leave them in here partially as an act of humility and partially to show you that you will make mistakes when you do this stuff. Nobody's perfect, including me, especially me. So. Let's see if I can do this around the camera and the light and every other million things in my way. And I just have this little hook. And I'm going to use that to grab this if I can see what I'm doing because I have the camera right in front of my face here. There we go. I'm just going to grab that up. I'm going to pull it up through here. And you have to make three turns. so. Here's our first turn. Let me drop this back down over. And I always pull the dial cord straight to make sure there are no kinks in it. Because this dial cord can actually get kinked up. And if it does, it really makes it difficult for it to pass over all the pulleys and everything. Now this has to go in front. like that. And you want to make sure you don't get yourself tangled when you do this. Isn't this fun to watch? Okay, see that little kink? We want to make sure that's out of there. And I'm going to hold this right here and pull this through, just like that. Now the next thing I want to do is kind of slide this back a little bit, because the next turn has to go in front of that turn. So now I'm going to come back over here, grab it again, and pull it up through. Here's number two. I mean, this is time consuming, but when you really look at it, it's not that hard to do. It's just a lot of people are really afraid of doing this and you know don't want to tackle this but it's really not that horrible especially if you have the diagram the, the biggest deal is having 
the service manual to show you how to do this. I don't know if you all remember that RCA radio I did, but that was not fun. That was the one that actually had the had that uh, split dial cord in two pieces with that idler pulley assembly in the middle. It was not fun. Okay, here we go. All right. So here we go. I'm gonna, it looks like that's number three right there. Because what they're saying, hold on. So if we look here, we can count. We have, this is called three turns, but there's actually two layers on, on the top here. And if we compare that to our little picture, that's what they want to see here. I hope this will focus. But you can see there's two layers on the top. Actually, there are three, so I got to go one more time around. So let's get that. We got one more wrap to go, and then we'll have it. All right. And there we go, our third turn. And then it goes up underneath this pulley right here. And then it goes around to the other side. So we're going to hold on to this for a minute. And let me reposition the camera. Okay, here we go. Now this goes underneath. So it goes under this one and then over this one. Comes around. And then we pass this through here, like so. Just like that. And there it is. Now this is going to go underneath here, like so. and come back around through the top. And this is where that little tool helps out. There we go. Okay, so now we just have to hold tension on this when we set it back down. Okay, we removed our spring here. I'm going to take that. And then I'm just going to bend this tab in a little bit. It's not super necessary, but just to help a little bit to keep it from falling off while we're working on this. I'm not going to bend it real far. Matter of fact, that's about all I'm going to push it. Which wasn't much, huh? All right, so we're going to pull this through just like that. And we're going to make our loop. And I'm going to have to do this off camera because it is a bit tough to do around the camera. So let me tie this off and I'll be right back. And there we go. Looks good. Very good. Okay, now that that's together, we can put the little dial pointer on. This dial pointer is kind of grungy. It's got some scratches on it. So we are going to freshen it up a little bit. And I just use quick drying correction fluid, this white out stuff. It works really well. It's very bright white. It dries really well. It's pretty durable. 
and it's very good at reflecting the light. So I'm going to put a coating of that on there and, we'll, and I'll show you what it looks like here in a minute. There it is and in a few minutes it'll be all nice and dry and we can put it on. Okay, let's see here. And there's our tuning. Very good. All right, now we're ready to uh, test this thing out. Hey, Mark. <laughs> well, I run a children's book, nobody bought it. And I can... Well, it's working, and it's working really well. <laughs> Uh, good luck, uh, but there really is no way to protect yourself on, uh, on that one. Did you know that you can also visit their website, ASAShelter.org? Now there's a lot of noise down here on the bench, so don't worry about that, because <clears throat> this is AM, of course. Or your intent to watch the, the game, you're just distracted meeting. You're just munching on whatever. Not bad, though. So before we start our alignment, let's go over the process of what they're going to have us do. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our signal generator, and we're going to align the intermediate frequency, or the IF stage, of this receiver. So this pin 7 here, this is our oscillator mixer tube, and at pin 7, they're going to have us inject a 455 kilohertz signal with a modulation on it so you can hear an audible tone I'm gonna put a 400 Hertz tone on it and then when we feed that in there we're going to align these three coils here ZZ1, ZZ2, and ZZ3 and they have you do all the measurements at the output so down here in the corner is your audio output and you can see the audio output right here and there's the volume pot and they just have us connect a an AC VTVM as, long, as well as our oscilloscope on there and we're just going to met, adjust these three coils both sides of each one for maximum amplitude. Now there are some other interesting things that they have us do on this alignment so that's kind of why I'm going to go over this because there are some, there is a, a unique thing to this circuit now that first step just peaking these three coils is pretty common to all AM radios you know if you've done a small AM table radio or something it's pretty common what we're doing but after we complete that they're going to have us take a, a signal generator and we're going to switch it over to frequency modulation to FM and we're going to inject an FM signal into this circuit. Now why would you want an FM signal? <laughs> well reading the procedure it's very vague the way they describe it but I'm going to try to do this the way they describe it. They're not talking about an actual sweep generator okay so I've heard of you know we've seen procedures where you take a for instance a sweep generator or a tracking generator on your spectrum analyzer and you put a swept signal and then you you sweep and, and actually look at the output the bandwidth of the coils and adjust them but that's not what they're having us do with this they're having us put a carrier signal and then they're having you FM modulate it with a minimum of 30 kilohertz bandwidth uh, for the modulation. And I'm going to use a 400 hertz tone once again. So I'm going to probably set that to about 50 kilohertz because it says use at least 30 kilohertz. And then what they have you do is go to this ZZ3 and the final coil, not the, not the top coil, but the bottom coil only. And they're going to have you fine-tune this. So we already set it for maximum amplitude, but then they're going to have us set it for the most uniform waveform. And it's probably not going to look real 
clean because there's a lot of things in here that's going to affect the rising and falling peak on that. So I think all they want you to do is make sure you have a nice looking curve there. So we'll see what it looks like and see if we can get it to do something. They don't really talk about anything else. They still want you to monitor the output on an oscilloscope at the audio output jack. So you're really not, you're not sweeping an RF signal in there and looking at it with a, you know, with a oscilloscope or, you know, with a, some sort of a uh, demodulator probe or, or a spectrum analyzer or something. They're actually still having you look at an audio signal. So that's going to be an interesting thing when we get to that stage. Then they're going to have us do the dial accuracy, which we're going to go back and we're going to adjust these capacitors for dial accuracy. So you're, you're going to set your oscillator and then you're going to go back and adjust the coils for the, so you have your upper dial and lower dial and the coils are going to adjust. Well, let me, let's look it up. They actually have us look at the upper side of the, the upper part of the dial scale. You're going to adjust your capacitors and for the lower part of the dial scale, you adjust your coils. I was having a senior moment there. So that's pretty standard as well. You just set it at 1400 kilohertz, adjust the capacitors for uh, you know maximum amplitude. Then you're going to put the dial directly on 600 kilohertz and then you're going to adjust the uh, coils for maximum amplitude. So far so good, huh? Other than that weird thing with this with the FM signal. But now there's another thing in here that they're going to have us adjust. And this is the part that's pretty interesting to me. If you notice there's a C25 capacitor and I'll show it to you when we do the procedure. And it's in series with this coil. And let's trace this through. This is your your detector diode. So this 6AL5 is one of those little short dual diode tubes. And they're using this for your demodulator to, to take the RF component off and just strip the audio. But if you look, the audio comes off of here. It goes down here, goes around here, through this little selector switch, and then into the input of your final audio. But if you notice, shunting that signal to ground is this coil and capacitor, and the capacitor is adjustable. This is actually a whistle filter, and this is only the second receiver that I've worked on like this, just plain AM radio, that ever had this type of circuit. The other one being that Dimec, uh, I think the DA5. Go back on my uh, videos, you'll see that. And the Dimec was actually, the McKay Dimec tuner was a solid state tuner. This one's, so this predates that by a lot. So the idea of that is we're going to inject a 10 kilohertz audio tone right into this uh, circuit up here. Uh, I think it's R14. You're going to inject it right up here. And then we're going to set this capacitor until you get the minimum output. So essentially what you're doing is you're setting this filter to filter everything above 10 kilohertz. And of course, below 10 kilohertz, there'll be a little bit of a roll off also, uh, you know, maybe it's somewhere around eight kilohertz or so you'll start seeing a roll off. And the idea is this is going to take all the whistles and birdies and things and try to take those out, out of the audio. Should it, so it should make the audio a lot cleaner. Remember, this is AM radio. This is not high fidelity <laughs> that you would get, uh, you know, with a CD player <laughs> or something. So what they're trying to do is make the mid-range sounds as clear as possible. So when you're listening to speech, or even when you're listening to the old uh, recordings, music recordings of the day, it would make this sound really smooth and really clean and not have a whole bunch of high frequency noise. So we're going to adjust that. And once we do that, we're done. So let's go through and do this. And uh, I've had a I'm on my 16th hour today, so it's been a long day. So hopefully we'll get through this procedure and I won't forget too much for you. And I'll 
keep everything straight. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been a long day. Anyway, let's get started. We'll now look at the very simple instructions for the alignment. And a couple of notes. They want your sensitivity set to maximum. They want you to align the pointer first and you set the capacitor fully closed and set the pointer to the last reference mark at the low frequency end of the dial, which we did that when we put that little dial on there. They're just talking about moving this all the way down to the zero so when the thing hits the end stop, it stops at the zero. Insulated screwdriver, we have that. They want the dummy antenna to just be a 0 .01 capacitor, which we have that right here. And you can see, I make these little these little adapters. All this is is a 0 .01 capacitor with a little clip on the end, and then you can connect your signal generator lead to that, and connect this to whatever they want you to go on. And they're saying they want you to connect it to pin seven which is the grid of V2, which is your 6BE6. So if we turn this around, I'll move the camera up. Some of you may be interested in this stuff, some of you may not. That's okay. So right here is going to be that pin 7. So you, if you look at the socket, I'll move this around because I have it somewhat connected already. Let me get some light on here. So let's zoom in. And you can see the space here between the two uh, pins. And you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's pin seven. And it said to connect that to pin seven. So that would be this pin down here just like that and then my signal generator wire is right here and I'm just going to connect it right on here like this I'll back you up so you can see what I'm doing just like that and our coils that we're going to adjust our little transformers there's one here one here and one down here at the bottom that you might not be able to see yet yeah right there at the bottom so those are the ones we're going to adjust, the bottom and the top of each coil. This is the, the, the pot, the volume pot for the output level. So we want that turned all the way up. The sensitivity pot is over here. We want it turned all the way up. And this is the output. This is the, where you'd plug your amplifier into. So I have my scope and I have my VTVM set to AC volts so we can measure the output of the signal. So we're actually going to, what we're going to monitor is the audio at the end, clear at the end. And then this is going to be a 455 kilohertz signal which represents that IF frequency. So we're kind of generating our own little IF frequency and we're going to set our IF uh, and tune it to that frequency with those four adjustments. And you can see on this side, here's the front side of those three cans. So these ones up here are your antenna cans. I don't know if you can see them there right here, these two. These are what we're adjusting down here. So I'm going to turn this around a little bit so I can get to it. And what we're going to monitor while we're doing this, I'll try to get it all in shot, is we're going to monitor this meter right here. So if I turn this thing on, I want to make sure I'm not going to electrocute myself or anything else. And we should be able to see. Okay, power on. Now, I also connect my oscilloscope. And the reason I do that is I want to see how clean the signal is as well. So I'm I'm a little bit more interested than just looking at the level output. I want to see how clean that 455 kilohertz signal is. So now that this has warmed up, we have our signal generator over here. It's set to 455 kilohertz. I'm at 
negative 12 dBm. Why is it that setting? Because that's just a, a good setting. It's a relatively strong signal. Uh, the IF amplifier section, the signal is already somewhat strong by the time it gets to there. So you need a, a stronger drive signal there than you would at the front antenna input of the tuner. 30% modulation, 400 hertz, it's pretty standard. And if we look over here, we have a very nice looking sine wave. And you can see it's right around 400 hertz. So this all looks good. And really all we want on the meter is we just want a good, good looking deflection on the meter. So you can see it's right there. So we're going to see if we can get that meter to increase. I'll bring this in a little bit. Hopefully we'll get everything in shot. Now the first thing I'm going to start, we have two sides to these, these coils. These IF cans have a bottom adjustment and they have a top adjustment on the other side that I showed you earlier. So we're going to start with the top of the first IF, which is this uppermost adjustment. And I'm just going to rotate that pot or that uh, adjustment, and we're going to see what happens. And you can see that one was peaked right on. You see how it's just, I'm going right through it. It goes up and then back down. I don't know if I can turn this down a little bit. Yeah. So make it a little more sensitive. So you can see right there, I went down, up, then down again. So it's peaked. And I, I have a feeling these are all going to be absolutely perfect because the way this thing performed, I'm pretty sure. Let's see if I can. This one may not have an adjustment on the bottom. Nope, I don't see a bottom adjustment on that. Oh, here we go. Okay. Nope, that one's going down. Oh. Yeah, it was perfect. See it? Okay, I have a feeling all three of these are going to be like that. So, there's our second one. That one's good. And we're going to go to this one down here. This is the second one. And you can see that one also is peaked. All right, third one. You have to go through this because you never know if one of them perhaps is a little bit out. Look, see that one was out. Look at that. Okay, that one was out. Nice. Okay, that one was out a little bit. Not horrible, but it was out. Let's see if we can get into there and do this one. And the bottom one also was slightly out, but not near to the point that the other one was. Okay. So those are done. So that's step one. That's all there is to it. Now the next step, we have a bunch of ditto marks here. So all this is going to stay the same. Really the only thing they want you to do, <laughs> they want FM modulation. That's unique. And they want a 30 kilocycle sweep. So they actually want us to put a sweep signal in there. And they want to set it to broadband. So we're going to set it to broad. And we're going to look at the oscilloscope. And we're going to set the bottom of Z3. And it's going to say, and it says, adjust slightly for a symmetrical curve on the oscilloscope. If this equipment's not available, omit this step. Well, we have that equipment, so we're going to do it. So let's uh, get this set up. And we'll check it out. All right, we have this set up. I weakened the signal just a little bit. 
still at 455 kilohertz, but now we're doing FM modulation, and they want at least 30 kilohertz. I'm set to 50. This will go from 0 to 99 kilohertz. And we're 400 hertz is the modulation signal. So that's the sweep right there. So anyway, that should be a good signal. And I have it fed in there right now, and you can see kind of an ugly looking thing in there. And all we're going to do is we're going to adjust that to get as symmetrical of a signal as we can. We can see it's kind of distorted and it's, it's overlapping. This is because of the sweep of the scope. But the idea is we want to clean this up as much as we can. And this is probably partially because of possibly a, uh, an old component something in one of the capacitors or something. I'm not sure, but we'll see if it cleans up. Let me see if I can get this in here. <clears throat> so I'm going to adjust the bottom coil of, of Z3, or of coil number 3. And that's certainly the wrong way. And the idea is we just want to clean this up till they kind of overlap. And I want to straighten that. As, and there's a little notch of distortion there. A little tiny bit right there. But I think that should be without having to get crazy. Let's see. There. Okay. Alright, that looks pretty good. And the corners look pretty good there. Let's connect back up and uh, let's change our sweep back to AM. So I'm going to do FM off and then go to AM. And we should have a really nice looking sine wave. And we do. So that looks pretty good. And you can see a little bit of noise in the background. If this was a phosphor scope, <laughs> you'd really see it. But that's because I weakened the signal. If I go back up, we can strengthen it and it's still picking up a wee little bit of noise but not bad okay so that looks good that looks very clean so that's good for the next adjustment they want us to go to 1400 kilohertz or 1.4 megahertz and still gonna have our same modulation AM 400 Hertz and now that we're going into the antenna jack I have it way down to 50 microvolts I'm now measuring microvolts and when we're done this is going to go way down but I want a strong enough signal still to be able to see something if you look on the scope there's a little bit of static which I want I want the tuner to be trying straining to amplify that signal and if we look down here, that's what we're going to use, is the meter. And there's three trimmers. There's this one, this one, and this one right up here. And I'm going to adjust those for maximum amplitude. So let me move this in a little bit. Like that. And this first one, and these have paint on them, so I guarantee you they're going to be perfect. So, okay, our first one, you can see it's going down. So we're going to go back up. I'm going to strengthen this signal just a hair. There we go. Okay. Right there, that one's good. Okay. That one's spot on, as I thought it would be. And here's the one that didn't have paint on it, so it's probably going to, it might be out a little bit. Nope, going down. Going down. So yes, it was right on. Okay, so those are set. And if you look, we're right on 1400. 
So that's very good. The dial accuracy is very good. Now let's go to our next step. We are now at 600 kilohertz. And you can see we have our signal, but there is a small problem. This is not right on the, on the 600. It's just a little bit off if you get straight on it, but it's pretty close. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the dial right on the 60, right like that. And you can see the signal got weaker, but that's okay. Because now we're going to adjust these three coils. Let me see if I can get the camera contorted in here. So we're going to adjust this little coil down here. You can see it. And then this one and this one. So these are the coils adjust the low dial scale and the capacitors adjust the high dial scale. So let me get back on here. And let me see if we can get that signal to clean up and to get stronger. So here we go. Hopefully this will, this first one I believe is going to be the oscillator. It would help if I put the right end of the tool in there. And right there. No, nope, can't go by that. You have to use the scope. See how that signal's getting stronger? but it's not really it's the noise that's getting stronger not the signal so we're going to use our oscilloscope and we're going to look for this for a clean signal so let me get down here okay and that's going down right about there Give a little more amplitude there. And we're looking for the cleanest signal. Okay. Right about there. And then we're going to adjust these other two. And that one was right on, you can see. All right. And then go to this one. Quite honestly, these, these adjustments were very close, so I think that's pretty good. All right, last but not least, they want a 10 kilohertz audio signal, and I'm running it at about 2 volts peak to peak, and they want that fed right into that 33K resistor right there. And where is that 33K resistor, you might say, you might ask. So, it is right here, R14, and that's right where it goes into the detector circuit. And they want us to adjust C25 for minimum deflection, so you want the smallest signal. And C25 is this capacitor right here. So I'm going to adjust that and you can see I'm pretty pretty far down as it is. But let's see where we are. We'll adjust it. And it dropped a little bit. Now it's going back up. See it? So let's bring it down. And we want as close to zero volts as we can get. And I'm on the smallest scale. I'm only on the 1.5 volt scale right now. So that's very, very tiny voltage. So that's about as far down as I can get it right there. So that's adjusted. And that's all there is to this alignment. So we're ready to connect this up and see what it does. All right, we're hooked up to an amplifier. And I have my outside antenna. And it is nighttime. So... Uh, we should be able to really pick up some signals on this. And uh, there is a ton of noise <laughs> in this basement. So I'm sure we'll get a lot of static, but I doubt that's what it would do when we get out of this environment. So this is worst case scenario. 
Let's turn the volume up and see what we can do. Same top wide receiver who's been out for injury slash disciplinary. Come on, look at five less than twenty, if you're lucky. I mean, come on. So yeah, the polls are just so super. I don't think this is the Getting all kind of crazy stuff at night. Every hair. If we had a real press in America, rather than play out their work at MRC Chicago, WCFS FM and HD1 Elwood Park, Chicago. An American astronaut and two Russian cosmonauts are on their way to the internet. So you heard it. That's Chicago, and I am in. That's Chicago, Illinois. I am near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If that gives you any idea how clear that is. Sergei Kuzveshkov blasted off from Kazakhstan. Their rocket... Which is... ...and... ...pretty good. And a vote for Biden will make everything... ...mother went from that... ...two weeks before from after the CCL. ...who was the person that gave it to the news? Doing things for my immune system, staying healthy. The great Dan Bongino last is broke. And family? And Patrick Show. Quick question on Bell. So you need the number one. Knee pain or foot pain from exercise or just getting older. You expensive real estate fees and all the work that comes with the tradition. Well, I think that's enough. You uh, get the point. This thing is super, super sensitive. Again, uh, kind of a bad case scenario because I'm in the basement at the bottom of a hill <laughs> surrounded by a bunch of noise and every little hair this thing picks up a station. This is actually one of the, this, this is a kind of has a reputation. They're very rare, these Series 80s, and they're the AM80 tuner, but they are a very, very well-built tuner. You can see why now. So this one's ready, ready to get put into use. And like I said before, what I'm thinking of doing is I am going to build a matching amplifier to go with it. Just a little vacuum tube amplifier with maybe a little oval, maybe a 6x9 type speaker or a small 8-inch speaker, something like that and I'll put it all in a nice case. So those will be a couple upcoming videos. And this will be a really nice AM radio to play with for anybody who still has AM. I mean, we, as you can see, I still have it in my area, although you really have to listen to it at night to really get all the, the clear channels and so forth. But anyway, this was a lot of fun and this is a great little receiver. It kind of surprised me. So anyway, until next time, I'm going to wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. I hope this was an interesting video. It was kind of done over a very long period of time, so it may be a little boring or inconsistent, but at least we got something out there. Anyway, take care, and we'll see you all very soon, and uh, stay well. Bye-bye.